very good experience to find yourself being told that you're not quite there yet on 680, so you keep on going, and you end up in San Jose. And then you turn around and try to rush back. But uh, somehow the Lord got us here. Everything that could have been thrown against us on the road was car trouble and everything else, so we're very grateful to be here. I kept saying over and over as I prayed going down the road uh, that this had to be something tonight, some type of fantastic meeting, because... Usually when we're this well thought getting to a place, something's going to take place. So I came in expecting something. I'm sure you were expecting to leave as late as it is. But um, if you must go, as they said, go ahead. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, bear with me. I'll try not to keep you too long. The only complaint that my pastor has against me is that I'm long-winded. And the only complaint that another pastor had last Sunday night was that I wasn't long-winded enough. He wanted to go to 11. I promise not to keep you that late. But anyway, uh, I don't fool around, so I'll just uh, start right out. I can only make you one promise that what I've got to say is the truth. It won't seem that way to some of you. It will just seem that I'm either crazy or I'm the biggest liar and, and storyteller in the world. That's what our televisions have done to us. They've gotten us to a plane of mind that we do not realize the real world around us. When I talk in many youth rallies, many of the Christian schools, I start right out by tearing their television and rock idols down by personal experiences that I've had with them in the occult world. And then from there, we try to build them up with real heroes, the number one being Jesus Christ. But uh, I come from a family that where I grew up having my own heroes. My number one hero was my great, 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 somewhere way back there, grandfather named Francis Collins. Francis Collins owned the first ship that the Puritans landed in here. It just so happened that 50% of the people on board were also witchcraft people fleeing from Scotland. And they were called the Collinses. They were all his family, and that's how all witchcraft came to the United States. So when I grew up, I was being trained how great my family was, that it was the second most important family in the Illuminati and the occult world, and that someday I'd be very important and so on. So I had my own heroes. And television didn't help much. The reason I'm so down on television is I grew up around the television world, on the insides of it. When I was just a teenager, Hollywood paid for my way out to California so that I could bring a couple of diaries that uh, belonged to my family that I had inherited by will as the last male heir of the Collins family. If you wondered why that fits with Todd's, the Collins family changed their name about 100 years ago to Todd to cover up some of the things that they had done. But I'm sure some of you will remember the show Dark Shadows. That was the show that paid for me to come to Hollywood to bring the diaries. Many of the scripts were taken from actual incidences in the diaries. And, for instance, Barnabas Collins was based upon a man named Prince Williams Collins, a Revolutionary War hero. When I was growing up in the occult world, we were always taught that we had been somebody else before. It wasn't good enough that we were the person we were now. We always had to be a dozen people that we were before. We had to deal with this life and all the ones we were supposed to have had before and all the ones we were going to have in the future. And I was supposed to be in France Williams Collins. So I said that's who they based Barnabas on, so I wasn't exactly the nicest guy in the world. I grew up this way. When I was 13, I was taken into what is called the outer court to be trained as a priest in witchcraft. That had been like your pastor who just stepped off, or better yet, more like the youth director or something. When I was 18, I was initiated a high priest. That would have made me the pastor. At the same time, I became draft exempt. I did not have to go into service. But a bunch of us smart aleck, young, I have to correct the pastor, not warlocks, but wizards and witches, went into the army because we felt the army really needed witchcraft. It just couldn't get along without us. And since the army didn't think that they needed any chaplains that were witches, we just kind of went in on our own. So I went on in, along with a lot of others, and I never did anything, I guess, halfway. I got in Vietnam, found out I liked Vietnam so well, I was willing to re-enlist. In fact, I'd already signed the papers to stay for another tour in Vietnam when I became wounded in the last month of the first tour, and I was shipped back to the United States. My time was almost up, so I was discharged, and the same day I re-enlisted. I asked for Vietnam, and they said because of my wounds that hadn't totally healed yet, I couldn't go to Vietnam yet, so I got Germany. And I had re-enlisted for six years. And until the time of my re-enlistment, I always thought that witchcraft was just witchcraft. There was nothing more to witchcraft 
than just casting spells and that we were smarter than the Christians and other religions because we really knew who the gods were and we were born with special powers because our ancestors had passed them down to us and all the little stories they liked to tell us. Witchcraft was a little different at that time. When I first got into it, as I was a young person, you had to be from a family that had generations after generations of witchcraft. In order to be a Coven member at the time, you had to have three generations at least. Well, the minimum that I had that we could find was seven. So there wasn't any problem, and we knew it went past that where there weren't records kept anymore. But uh, that was all witchcraft was. As I tell many people, when you know many of you were raised as Christians, and I guess that's why I can't understand why some of the Christian teenagers are the way they are today, if they were raised, in this glorious gospel, why they're so rebellious. I would have given anything to have been raised this way. But uh, when you were learning the 23rd Psalm, I was learning the witch's chant. When you were reading about Moses opening the Red Sea, I was reading J.R.R. Tolkien. When you guys were re- uh, learning uh, different memory verses and so on and the four spiritual laws and the Ten Commandments, I was happened to read C.S. Lewis. Of course, I've been greatly surprised that Christians read that too. But uh, this is the way I grew up, and this is all I believed in was just that there were mighty gods and we were special people. We were their priests and priestesses until I re-enlisted. I went to Germany, spent a month home, went to Germany, spent another month, two months out of a six-year enlistment. One night while taking drugs and drinking, I shot and killed an officer in downtown Stuttgart. Now, if there's one thing that the Army does not like, it does not like its sergeants killing its officers. They have a quick cure for that. They threw me in solitary confinement. And as the court-martial proceeded on, and things began to look like I was going to spend the rest of my life in Leavenworth, if I was lucky, all of a sudden a riot took place in the stockade, and although I was in solitary confinement, other people were placed in the cell with me. One of the men that was placed in the cell with me had been scheduled to get out that particular day and was held because of the riot. So I kind of talked him in by bribing him a little, that uh, if he made a long-distance phone call for me and told certain relatives of mine that I was in trouble, he'd receive some money for it, and I'd be a lot happier. So he called, collect to Los Angeles, and talked to my foster mother, explained what the situation was. And I was sitting back waiting for her to get all these big witches together to cast spells on the judges and make all the officers that were trying me think I was a real nice guy and that it was self-defense and everything was going to be fine. They just let me off. Now, that's all that I had ever been taught that witches could do. But three days later, my cell door opened there in solitary. As I stepped out in the light for the first time in 32 days, I heard some very strange words. You are honorably discharged from the United States Army. And the man that was saying them was a senator by the name of William Saxby. He had a congressman with him named Wiley and about three or four generals. And they were handing me an honorable discharge. And on the discharge papers, it didn't say I was bad. It didn't say that I had been in jail. It didn't say anything. It gave me all my time and rank, security clearances that I had in my possession, and didn't explain why I still had over five years to go in the United States Army. It just discharged me honorably. So as I took it and didn't want to argue with him and left and went back to the States and arrived at my home in Columbus, Ohio, I asked my real mother, I have two mothers, foster mother and a real mother, I said, what type of spell is so good that it makes senators and generals do what you want? And it's a really good spell. I like to learn it. She just looked at me and said, you just don't understand, do you? She said, They're, that what, we didn't cast a spell on them. They're with us. I said, oh, far out. Senators that are witches. She says, no, they just belong to us. And I didn't understand what she was saying. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do now? You know, I'd like to take my old coven back over and so on. So she handed me an envelope that had been waiting there. She had explained that there was one there and one in Los Angeles. They didn't quite know where I was going to show up. I opened the envelope. Very intriguing thing. $2,000 and $100 bills. A lot of money. Also was a one-way plane ticket to New York City. I said, well, what's this for? She said, well, you make a reservation. You get on the next plane. You get out of here and you get to New York City and they'll meet you at the airport. I said, well, who are they? And where did this money come from? She says, you get there. And they'll tell you, and you'll know who's supposed to meet you when you get there. Now, witches are very curious people. That's why when we do some of the most demonic rites imaginable, and our hair would stand on end and almost turn snow white overnight from all the spooky things, we couldn't wait to get back in there. We were always curious what was going to happen the next. 
I think that's why some of the people get on roller coasters and like to be scared to death. It's just the way with the witches. They really like spooky things going on, and they can't wait to get back, and this was extremely intriguing. So I got on the plane, and I flew to New York, and I got off the plane. Sure enough, no problem with recognizing who met me. I'd read his books for years. In fact, he's the man who first created Christian witchcraft. His name was Dr. Raymond Buckland, head of the anthropology department, Columbia University. At that time, he isn't now. Graduate of Oxford University, Rhodes Scholar, handpicked by the Rothschilds to lead the Illuminati for him. So I arrived, and he took me to his house, and the next few months, he carefully rearranged all my ideas for me. He told me that all the things that I had learned about witchcraft were just stories that we told the lower people. And where I thought there was only three levels, and I was as high and as powerful as a witch could go, he assured me there were three more. I guess I should have backed off then and figured if I was lied to the first time, maybe I'd be lied to the second time. But as I said, witches have an incurable curiosity. They've got to find out everything. So I let him train me. He explained to me that since I was a male Collins, I was in the Collins family, that I had a position to take. And that there was a board of directors called the Grand Druid Council, which contained 13 of the most powerful witches in the world. And that my place was on that council. And I said, oh, you know, great. When do I take it? And he said, well, somebody just died. I kind of always wondered if he died or they shot him or something. You never can tell in the Illuminati. But uh, he sent me to Los Angeles. I studied for six more months with my foster mother, holding kind of a temporary rank on this council, and then taking up the Colorado Springs and initiated. And I do believe that when I testified here at the last time, I explained who the person was that handed me the ceremonial night for that ceremony, another senator named George McGovern. You might, before the night gets over, start to realize that Washington isn't bad as you thought it was. It's worse. But uh, the ceremony, by the way, was human sacrifice. And the leader of that ceremony that night was George McGovern. That's why when we did the broken cross, we drew his picture into the broken cross as a person practicing human sacrifice. But after the ceremony, I went down to San Antonio and decided that would be the perfect place. And I moved into San Antonio to watch all the drug traffic in the area, and I was given a 13-state area. That totaled out to about 65,000 initiated witches and wizards, priests and priestesses. Now, that's just the staff of the church. That's not the congregation. So if there's that many ministers in that area... You can imagine what the population is. In California, whereas most of the Grand Druids have many states like I did, I had 13, California has a Grand Druid all to itself because there's that many witches in California. In fact, it's the most populated area in the world for witchcraft. And uh, the Bay Area just happens to have the most. But anyway, this is where I lived. I only left it eight times a year to attend what we called council meetings. Now, to give you an idea, Monday was one of those council meetings. They hold them eight times a year. May 1st, they held a council meeting. And from our information, they held it in San Francisco. So you were kind of close to it this time. Things went along fine. I enjoyed the money par. I always thought they were kind of weird because they kept talking about controlling the world. And I thought, let's stay back with witchcraft, you know, this this world government thing, you know, they're a little weird, which is never going to control the world. And finally, on August the 1st, 1972, things changed. Courier from the London Embassy, a member of our United States State Department, arrived with a courier document pouch sealed with the crest of the State Department, brought it through customs, unopened, nobody could touch it, brought it in to San Antonio, and I was hosting the meeting this time. And it was on Latimus, August the 1st. The man came in, laid the pouch down in the temple room up in the casino building, walked out, and left it. He wasn't to know what was in it. The door was locked, security guards were placed on the outside, and Dr. Buckland took up what's called the Atame, the witch's ceremonial night. He slid open the seal, unlocked everything, and took out six letters. We'd seen letters like this before, no big deal. They had the crest of the Illuminati, which is on the back of your $1 bill, so you can look at it later. On them, sealed in wax, red wax. The only problem was that the first four were standard business. They only contained checks, you know, I, you know, 
bribe checks and so on. Usually bribe checks start at about $500,000 to give you kind of an idea and work up into the millions. But then they've got almost all the money in the world. Why should they worry? You spend a $5 bill and you panic. For what a $5 bill feels like to you, a million dollars feels like to them. So believe me, they've got the financial strength to do it. The fifth one was totally different. It's very thick, about 30 pages, and it was handwritten. Now, according to the laws of witchcraft, if anything is religious, it must be written in a spatial ink with a dip pen, and the person who's writing it own handwriting. Nobody, you know, you don't dictate it. It doesn't get typed up. Nobody writes it for you. Now, on the Illuminati, the Rothschilds are not humans. They're not the, just the richest family in the world. They are gods in human bodies. More, more or less the counterfeit of what Jesus Christ was when he was on the earth. They're the sons and daughters of Lucifer in human body and his wife and so on. So that this council that I was on is the private priesthood of those gods. And when those gods talk, the priests listen and the priestesses listen. Then they tell political people. That's why a handful of witches have so much power over so many political people. Because they're simply just like a tape recorder for some very powerful people that everybody else considers to be holy and to be gods. So we opened this one in Philip Rothschild's handwriting, and it would have been the same to what well, it was like, you know, the gods sent their own private message. So we opened it up. Dr. Buckland started reading it. It's a chart. A friend of mine, Dr. Tom Berry, has placed that chart in a 30-page book, and we're proofing it now, and Dr. Stuart Crane is going to publish it, and we hope to have it in Christian's hands in about three months. It's a step-by-step -step plan beginning in 1973, at the first of the year, to the end of 1980, to take over the world by taking over the United States. Now, before you think that that's impossible, I've watched the news over the past five and a half years, and they're not only on schedule, they're a year ahead of schedule. And when I told people this five years ago, they thought I was crazy, like a lot of people think now. When I told them that we were supposedly not going to have any fuel, although we were going to have it, and that the gasoline prices were going to go sky high, I even told them a crazy story that the farmers were going to go on strike and the coal mines were going to close down. Now, I wonder where I could have gotten a crazy idea like that. And I was saying it five years ago. Only when I went on the East Coast this time, nobody was laughing because they were getting cut back on electricity and people were only working 20 hours a week because there wasn't any coal. So after reading this, I thought, mm, these people are really crazy. You know, crazier and crazier. But I stopped laughing when I read the sixth letter. It was in Philip Rothschild's handwriting too. Now before I tell you what's in it, I want to say something. The Mormon doctrine and the witchcraft doctrine are almost identical in how the world began. According to the witches, Lucifer chose his son and his daughter, which were married, to come to the world and lead the rest of his little kids down here. Believe it or not, they're supposed to have landed in a flying saucer. And they landed here, and man was just more or less assuming their shape from apes, and they intermarried with man, and that's how, well, the original people were the witches that arrived, and their children became the witches, and the ones that they didn't marry with are the mortals. If you remember Bewitched, you remember the doctrine of, of witches and mortals. Now, that may seem a little crazy to you, but they firmly believe it. And that Adam, who had the ability to turn back into other lives again, like everybody else did, did not. Because when the evilness of man settled into the garden, and that's why the garden was bad, there's no original sin according to witches. And Lucifer had planned to come and live on this world along with his children, but he couldn't because of all the evilness of man. And when they say that, I almost feel like they want to write Christians sometimes, the, the way the doctrine goes. But Adam would come back to bring peace to the world and to unpollute it so his father could come back. Now, that's their doctrine. And when the sixth letter said, we have found Adam to be in the world, and he is ready to make peace so that his father can return. I knew enough about revelations in the Christian Bible to say, hey, I'm in the wrong camp. And I asked a very stupid question at that moment. I said, isn't this in the Christian Bible? Now, witches teach that the Christian Bible is an absolute lie created by the God of evil named Jesus. Okay? 
So when I asked that, I almost got lynched. Sometimes more or less like the Christians like to do when I'm two hours late. i got to get you last somehow. So I said, well, you know, I'm just kidding. Don't worry about it. I was just joking, trying to lighten things up. They calmed down. I left and did some more drugs. Now, I was doing about $150 a day worth of crystal speed at the time. I weighed about 149 pounds. And I, after looking at some of my rock friends like David Crosby that's doing $200 a day worth of drugs now, I firmly believe that if the Lord hadn't saved me, I probably wouldn't have made it another year. At that time, from August the 1st on, for the next 30 days, I thought of nothing but how to get out. But even though I realized that the Christian Bible was telling the truth, it just never dawned on me because of the spirits inside me that if it was telling the truth in that, then salvation and Calvary were real also. So I went on trying to think of a dozen places I could go hide in this world and marking everyone off that they'd find me any place I'd go and deciding that since, you know, if I died, I'd just come back in another life and that wouldn't be too good if they were running the world, so what was I going to do? Finally, God, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to say that because I come from a world that Lucifer has been God too. Finally, the Lord Jesus Christ started moving for this the best way I know how to put it. I don't believe in accidents. I don't believe that my salvation or anybody else's salvation was an accident. I believe in God incidents. I believe that God sets in motion the things to bring you about. You still have the choice. But many of you who don't know him tonight, the Lord brought you here whether you know it or not. Much of you were probably brought here by praying friends and relatives. A man found his daughter, a pastor by the name of Smith, found his daughter, an initiated witch, shortly thereafter, who had, he told me later, he said, I, I couldn't believe it. Here I was, I went to Baylor University, I was a minister in the Southern Baptist Church, and Baylor did everything but hit me over the head that there was no devil and no witches and no demons in this day and age, much like many fundamental Bible colleges I know today. He said, so I had to relearn all over again. Instead of taking man's idea, I took the word of God. I found that Deuteronomy 18, 18, 19, and 20 gave a list of witchcraft in the occult world. And that Acts 16, 16, 17, 18, and 19 gave the power over witchcraft. What its power was and how to handle its power and the power over it. Which is the taking authority over the devil and the demons that are in witches. That's how they get their power. The stronger the witch, the more demons that they have allowed in. When they take a young person and they train them for witchcraft, they give them what's lovingly, I guess, called homework. They give them assignments that they're to do. And the assignments tear down every moral fiber and training that the person has. And just literally, they become a human chalice. They fill up with demons. As they do these things, they break down all the barriers holding the devil back. And when they're done, they have a very programmed, very brainwashed, and very powerful supernatural witch or wizard. So he prayed and he fasted. I heard Jack Howells the other day. I guess I never realized until I heard him how little Christians pray and fast. He's been around a long time and says he's only met a handful of praying and fasting Christians, and I can believe it anymore. But this minister prayed and he fasted. He said, God, let me cross Lance Collins' path. And that was my occult name. He prayed and he prayed and finally he felt this is the time. And he got up one morning, Saturday morning, a few days before Labor Day in 1972. And he went downtown and he started going through the occult stores. Now, I'm never in the occult, was never in the occult stores there much. And the one building that I lived in, there were two occult stores in that building, downtown San Antonio. One day, one of the managers that Saturday morning had had an overdose of drugs, was critical and couldn't make it in, and I had to go unlock the place for the sales girl to come in. And I just unlocked, got all the cash fixed up and everything, was getting ready to leave, hadn't been there more than about five minutes, and his pastor came in. I knew he was a Baptist the moment he walked through the door. They carried a big black Bible. You have to be in southern Texas to understand. They don't go any place without a big black Thompson or something like that. He carries Schofields up here. They carry Thompsons down there. As one pastor says, I like a rapid-fire Bible. But he came in, and I remember telling Linda, the girl that was with me, oh, boy, here comes trouble. 
he walked up and he said, I'm looking for Lance Collins. And I kind of braced myself and I said, I'm Lance Collins, can I help you? And he said, well, I want to tell you about the love of Jesus. I said, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. You take your Christian garbage and you go somewhere else. I remember the words very distinct. So he started preaching anyway. They figured he was there. He just dug his heels in and opened up. Well, I gave him about two sentences, and the spirits in me took over, and they started cussing. He just kept on preaching. So I started reciting chants, demonic chants, out to block what he was doing. Usually, it got Christians scared, and they ran off. He didn't touch. He stopped, and he said, well, I see. Ephesians 6, 12. I'm not warring against Lance Collins. I'm warring against the demons inside him. So, since they want to talk to me, I order them to be silent in the name of Jesus. And he just started in a very powerful prayer, pleading the blood of Jesus Christ, and finally ending with this. this is, I order, in the name of Jesus, the devil to stop giving you any power of witchcraft, and to stop giving you any of his benefits, and took one look at me and saw that I was on drugs, and said, and stop giving you drugs. Now, parents, listen to me. If your kids are on drugs, and you've got a problem, stop preaching to them. Just order the demon inside them and the devil to stop supplying them the drugs. You'd be surprised, we've done it, how fast the pushers and dealers they're getting their drugs from get busted all of a sudden. Try it. It works. And when he was done, he says, now I'm going to pray and fast for you, Lance, until you get saved. And I, I don't know why I said it. I, I just said, you're crazy. Can I, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. I remember I've told dozens of witches, I'm going to pray and fast until you get saved. Don't do that. One thing a demon does not like is prayer and fasting. He turned around, he walked off. One thing that had intrigued me, I, I kept trying to convince myself that I had shut up to listen to him because he was so weird. But what it was, was simply he had taken authority over the demons and I had shut up and I had heard the whole thing. I went on upstairs, very shaken and not knowing why, very sick and not knowing why. I'd never felt like this in my life. I'd never come up against a Christian like this. Usually I said, I'm a witch and they couldn't wait to find the nearest bomb shelter or crawl under the bed or get the straitjacket out. Well, something about my eyes back then, they never questioned when I said I was a witch. They just took off running. So I went upstairs, took out my drugs, my needle, did a fix. No problem. I had sent all the rest of my drugs out that night, big shipments that we had stored around the area, to other states because we had a huge shipment coming in that night. I said, boy, this will teach that dumb preacher. I ought to go over and drop off a, a kilo of it on his door just to teach him that the devil doesn't exist and I don't get my drugs from the devil. And... He can't stop me from getting drugs. Besides, there's nothing wrong with drugs. I'm just literally dying, eaten away from them. There's nothing wrong with drugs. This is how the young people are today. Their friends are overdosing. I've, I've talked with people, 14 to 15. I said, how many friends have you, do you lose every year? Oh, 10, 20. They overdose on, on angel dust or something. Killer weed, different things. But there's nothing wrong with drugs. I had asked one girl... Why she's so bummed out? She says, well, this is the fifth girlfriend that's ended up in the mental hospital not knowing who she is from taking acid and having a bad trip. And I said, do you take it? She says, sure, but I don't have any bad trips. There's nothing wrong with acid. When I got saved, I didn't have a friend that either wasn't in jail or wasn't dead. It'll do you something to you to walk into your friend's apartment and see him laying on the floor, needles still in their veins and dead from an overdose or from strychnine being added to the drug because they wanted them out of the way. I went on upstairs, as I said, I did the drug. Not to worry, more drugs coming in. Except midnight, my phone rang, and I was still speeding. I, wasn't, I hardly ever slept, hardly ever ate. Answered the phone, and I said, yeah, yeah, what's going on? Private number, I knew it had to be somebody that knew it. And they told me a story that I didn't like too well. We had paid off the border patrol. Everything was taken care of, standard run of drugs. Except that night, the ATF had heard that some illegal aliens were coming across the border. They called all the Border Patrol over, you know, from the regular stations, and had put on reserve units. And a guy that was so spaced out, he had sampled a little of pure speed. There was three huge carts about this big, close to a million dollars worth of speed, in the back of the car, just sitting on the back seat with the lid off, where everybody could see it. He wasn't worried. Drove up to the thing, and the guy wheels out a gun and says, you're under arrest. It was all over in a matter of moments. I'm sure he never even realized what happened. It was all because a preacher took authority over the devil. When I got that call, come flooding back. You know, this guy's weird. You know, here he is stopping my drugs. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, that's just an accident. But it never had happened before. 
So I realized after, you know, calming down about the situation that I was going to be going through withdrawal pretty soon. So I made some local calls. Nobody had anything. Most people around there were on heroin and not speed. So I made some out-of-state calls and finally found in the state of Ohio some of the drugs that we had sent on had arrived and they would get them down there, but it would be like Tuesday morning because of legal police actions they were having up there. But that's too long for somebody on drugs as bad as I was. Sure enough, by Monday night, I almost didn't know who I was anymore. Bound and determined that I was going to get drugs no matter what had to be. I got a handgun, went in my car, started a car, started to drive out. I was going to go to every area around that I knew if I had to kill the person, I was going to get drugs. And wrecked the car trying to get out of the parking lot. Just got out of the car, left the gun and everything, just sitting there. Started walking down the street kind of in a daze, trying to get myself together and came upon a movie theater. Big bright lights attracted me. Just paid my money. Wasn't paying attention to the movie. Nothing. Went on in. Got about three rows back right from the screen. Here was some idiot up there ra- waving a Bible all over the place and fl- uh, flash bulbs going off. And it was a movie called The Cross and the Switchblade. As I got mad about this, what am I into now and stuff, I started getting intrigued with a character named Nicky Cruz. And I guess I probably got everybody in that theater mad at me because I kept yelling at Dave Walker, so stay away from him, preacher, dumb Christian, leave him alone. He's just fine the way he is. All the way through the movie, cussing this guy out and telling him to leave Nicky Cruz alone. Finally, something very weird happened. Now, we knew that Christians talked about being born again. But then, born again was a phrase used by the Masons and a phrase used by the witches. didn't mean anything. But we had been taught by the doctrine of astrology, which, by the way, it takes three things to practice witchcraft. Astrology, herbs, and jewelry, or talismans. So, witchcraft or an astrology I learned from a very early child. One thing I'd been taught was I was born a set personality. The stars had decided what my personality was going to be like. And there was no way, no right in witchcraft, no nothing that would ever change my personality. If I was bad, I was bad. Besides, I didn't consider myself too bad. I mean, I could have always been a Christian. That would have been terrible. So I sat there and I watched him, and he changed. He wasn't just as saying, I'm born again. He changed. Now listen to me tonight. If you've walked the aisle and you've given your heart to God, and there wasn't a complete turnaround a complete change, and you went back to the way that you were five minutes before you walked that out, something is wrong. I'm not a Billy Graham that will have you say three words and say you're saved. It's in the fruit, and if there has not been a change in your life, something's wrong. And I got up and I walked out of that theater in utter confusion. Here was another thing that was in the Word of God that was happening. I walked on out, man walked up, about a dozen of us, I guess, were walking out of the theater at the one time. He walked up and he passed one track out. He gave it to me. He turned around, didn't say much. He just said, this is for you. Turned around and walked off. The track was called Bewitched. So I sat there and I read. I said, hmm, this guy's pretty smart. He says that Bewitched was put on by the witches. Well, I knew that. My foster mother was one of the producers. I practically grew up on the sets. I sat there and I watched... The rest of the track, Ouija board being run by demons. Well, we knew that. That's why witches didn't use Ouija boards. We let the Christians use it. So I read on, but the one thing I could not get over was this hell thing with the flames and the devil. Because witches don't believe in the devil. Satanists do, not witches. So I said, ah, this guy's so right, but he's probably just a dumb Christian. Threw it in the water, walked on. Started going to go back to my apartment, got in the casino building. Heard the music coming from one of our nightclubs there called the Club Aquarius. Decided to go on over. Nobody there that I knew except the staff. So I went on back and locked the door to the manager's office and I sat down. I said, I got to think this thing out. I'd like to talk to a Christian. I was talking to a man on the phone today, Jack Chick, and he was going over all the people that he had found in his investigations that were on the Illuminati payroll that were ministers, supposed to be fundamental ministers. And I said, yeah, I know, Jack. As I sat in that manager's office that night, he knew my testimony. I said, my biggest problem was I spent two hours trying to think of a pastor in the town that we did not have on our payoff. Well, there were pastors. That's why I didn't know them, because they weren't on our payoff. And finally, I remembered that just the night before, one of our witches, which was a prostitute in the area, in downtown San Antonio, had come in screaming in the Club Aquarius, and I wasn't in the mood to hear any screaming, particularly from her at the moment, going through withdrawal. But she was complaining that she was going bankrupt. And what the problem was, 
Well, she, her area was over by the Greyhound bus station. She'd be over there prostituting. And some idiots from a Christian coffee house would come over and preach to the guys. And she would proposition them. That could really put you out of business. I mean, no serviceman's going to walk off with a prostitute with somebody telling them about hell at the same moment. So she decided we had to do something about the place, and I told her to get lost, but I remembered it. And I said, well, that's only eight blocks away. It's only two in the morning. Nobody would be in bed at two in the morning. Which is a night, people, you know. Took off walking on over there. The place had a reputation of its own. Just three months earlier, it had been a burlesque place, show bar with strippers in it. Baptist preacher said, enough is enough. We don't need this down here. He goes in, jumps up on the bar stool, up on the bar, shoves two strippers in the middle of their act off the bar, and starts preaching. Fifteen minutes later, the two strippers have pulled the curtains down off the wall, wrapped them around them, kneeling down at the bar, giving their heart to the Lord. They're still Christians this day, by the way. I, I know them. The man and woman that owns the place is praying and giving their heart to the Lord. Three members of the four-piece band are two of the three bartenders, and about 15 of the customers. That's a quick revival. I like to have that quick. So I went on over there. Now, they had turned the tie, the deeds of this place when they got saved. This is what I mean about a change in your life. They could have rented the building out. They took the deed, and they gave it to one of the Baptist churches in the area and said, do what you want with it. Just turned it into a Christian coffee house. What better way? So I went over opened the door, and it was supposed to close at midnight according to sign, but the door was unlocked. So I went on in, and one guy was there, bent over the Coke fountain. You know, they trained, changed the booze over for Coke. That's what some Christians haven't done. And he was sitting there working on the Coke fountain, and I went in, and we started talking. And he started witnessing to me. Now, I have nothing against the four spiritual laws or any set plan like the Roman trail or anything like this. They, they're fine. They've won thousands of souls. But that particular plan didn't mean anything to me. I wasn't even interested in it, because for mainly I didn't believe totally the Word of God. And I wanted something that would deal with my immediate problems, and I wasn't hearing anything. Finally, he realized that he needed some help, so he called up his pastor. Now, as everybody knows, nobody calls their pastor at three in the morning, do they? No, just all the time. So he called him up, and the pastor says, well, we've been praying and fasting for this guy along with some other churches. We'll get right on it. I imagine he probably called up a bunch of people. And he'd come back and he said, Now, Lord, this is out of my hands. The man's name was Claude Elmer. He said, This is out of my hands. I don't know the first thing about witchcraft. I don't know the first thing about the devil's kingdom. But you do. And he quoted Luke uh, chapter 10, where the Lord had saw the devil fall from heaven, and we had power over the devil. And he said, Now, you were there when it happened. You educate me right now. What scriptures do I give this man? And he said, I'd like to read you something. And he opened his Bible. To 2 Timothy 1.7, it is the best scripture in the world to witness to anybody in the occult. Because when you're in the occult, there's one thing that you do not have. You do not have a mind without fear 24 hours a day. You live in a nightmare world, and you try to convince yourself by brainwashing yourself that you're not unhappy. And he sat there and he said, God can remake your mind and take away the fear. And when he said, take away the fear, I said, let's get with this thing right now. And he started praying with me, and he led me in a prayer of salvation. And I remember when I closed, I said, Lord, I want your forgiveness. I want to miss hell. I believe in it now. But I want you to take this fear out of my life. And I said, they're shaking. Scared to death. Somebody's going to walk through the door any time and see me in this place and report me. I said, Lord, take the fear away. And when I got up out of there, I didn't have any fear. In fact, I walked back, went right on in my apartment, sat down, took a Bible with me. And when I went down the next day... I was reading the Bible walking into the occult store. The fear was so far gone, I was got myself killed. When God does it, he does it right. Now, we've been trying to minister to people in the occult for a long time. We've really been spinning our wheels for five and a half years. We've gotten about 500 people saved. About 50 of them have been killed. When I was here last, we've been in prayer for two weeks about a new idea that we felt would work. And that was a retreat for the occult to go to. This Monday, on their New Year's Day, could have been arranged better. We didn't do it on purpose, but it was perfect. While their grand druids were meeting, our rehab center opened. First candidate is already in it. Right now, coming from Maryland, is a girl that's the second most powerful person that had ever left the Illuminati. Philip Rothschild's own girlfriend, teenage girlfriend. 
leaving, left of the occult from the 11th richest family.